You're listening to Online Pet Health Podcasts with Dr. Megan Kelly, continuing education for veterinarian rehabilitation therapists. Learn more at OnlinePetHealth.com. Hey, vet rehabbers. Welcome to the Vet Me Rehabilitation Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Megan Kelly, and thanks for joining me on another one of my Behind the Vet Rehab Practice Podcasts. I'm joined by an online pet health member and vet rehabber, Lisa Mason. She owns Florida Veterinary Rehabilitation, and this practice is growing from strength to strength. She achieved her five-year plan in one year, and I'm really looking forward to chatting to her and diving deep into how she's done this and hopefully learning some pearls of wisdom from her. She is also passionate about educating, and she is regularly lecturing at conferences in the veterinary rehabilitation field. And I'm so excited to chat to her. So welcome, Lisa. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Megan, for having me. Now, Lisa, one of the questions I always ask is how people get into the field. And generally, it's because of some patients or some dog or cat that they're treated. So I'd love to hear from you how you got into the field, because looking at all the things that you've done, you have a diverse history in treating animals from veterinary to conservation. So Give us, mm-hmm. give us the lowdown. Well, I originally started, um, you know, a long time ago before um, I really knew what I was going to do and wanted to be a vet and shadowed my uh, family vet. And uh, just, I mean, I think I was maybe six and I loved it. And my vet would allow us to walk around and, you know, see dentistry and things like that. And Um, and then one day my sister's dog was hit by the postman in our front yard and died in my arms. And I was like, I can't do this anymore. Um, this is way too emotional for me. So ended up going in the path of medical school, which was my father's, um, and my grandfather's legacy. And, um, and, and I enjoyed it and I thought it was great. And then all of a sudden I decided not to follow in the footsteps and to make my own path after um, already going to uh, Emory University in Atlanta and having done all of my pre-med requisites and things like that and um, ended up deciding to go to Africa and be an environmental educator and an environmental scientist. And that was amazing. That was awesome. Um, living at the base of Kilimanjaro for a semester and doing wildlife management really opened my eyes up to the impact we can have on the environment. And so I took that when I went home and and found a wonderful job working as a raptor rehabilitation therapist, as well as um, being an environmental educator. So I learned that I had a knack for teaching people, and I also really loved working with animals again. And after doing that for a few years, I really realized I missed the medicine piece of it. So I uh, ended up shadowing the vets that worked with us and went into um, went ahead and did the last prereqs I needed and and got into vet school and went to Auburn University uh, College of Veterinary Medicine where they have a raptor center there so I could maintain uh, what I was already doing and helping raptors to heal their injuries. We do a lot of passive range of motion. We retrain them to uh, fly again. And so all of that physical therapy I was already doing with birds and I thought my path was going to be as an exotic vet. So I did an internship at, or an externship at LSU, and then my travels took me to Florida, uh, where I went to an integrative practice and fell in love with integrative medicine, acupuncture, and physical therapy and chiropractic, and uh, decided that that was the direction I was going to head, and, and there started my career. And the other reason, too, is that I would see these patients come in and the dogs were not able to walk. Everything else was completely fine with them, and their owners were like, well, it's time to euthanize. And that wasn't a good enough answer for me. Um, I figured that I could find a way to help them. And uh, so there I started my journey in uh, rehabilitation therapy first at uh, Canine Rehab Institute. And then I went to the Chi Institute and got trained in uh, veterinary acupuncture. And I've also done herbal courses, nutrition courses, uh, geriatric courses. Um, I just continue to learn as much as I possibly can um, because I love it. Um, And I feel like I'm not doing my patients a a service if I don't know everything I possibly can know about their disease. Yeah, it's one thing that's quite nice about specializing is that Mm -hmm. you then can really focus. I mean, it was one of the things about veterinary itself that I didn't like. I didn't Mm -hmm. like being a master 
and not not actually knowing exactly everything about everything, whether it's yeah. dermatology, cardiology. Um, so, but then still in our field, there's just so much to know, isn't there? And everything so is much. changing and growing so quickly. Mm-hmm. I'm really interested to know whether you got any credits for having done, started with um, human medical and then went into Bethany or did you have to start straight from scratch? No, fortunately, I was right in the six year window um, of taking my prereqs. So I uh, I just skirted right under there. And if I didn't get into vet school the first year, then I was like, oh, I'm going to take some of these back again. Um, but I didn't. I actually was able to just kind of top off a couple of prereqs and then be able to get into that school. And um, I get into a couple of schools and decided to go with Auburn, of course, because of the, the Raptors. And I tell you, that was the best decision ever. I absolutely loved every single minute of my career at Auburn. And and talk about overload because I like fell in love with the equine medicine, the large animal medicine. I mean, we got to work in the dairy and I loved it. And I was just like, wow, what do I do now? Um, and I kind of actually saw zoo medicine as like my, we're going to mix everything together and I'm going to get to know about everything. Um, and it just, I had to figure out like my specialty and it took me a few years. Um, it took a lot of years of being really stressed out, of overworking, of trying to maintain this fast paced, um, I know everything about a, you know, a lot of things. And then finally, I think my brain settled once I was able to specialize in a, in a, a certain direction. And now I wanna know everything there possibly is to know about rehab and acupuncture. And, and, and that's just, that's the way that I've decided to go. And I think I'm finally like happy with, with that decision, you know, uh, finally happy with internally, you know, settling with knowing I'm going in one direction, but straight out of that school when somebody was like, well, are you going to do an internship? Are you going to do residency? I, I mean, I didn't know what to, you know, focus on at that point. Um, so I was really glad that I didn't do that. And I waited. Um, to kind of see what medicine and what practicing medicine actually gave me out of, uh, you know, years of experience, so. And all that experience that you had um, with the Raptors, do you use that Mm. now? So are you seeing quite a lot of exotics? Are you known as sort of an exotic rehab vet? So not yet. Um, I've, I, so what I did was I was in my neighborhood. I was the wildlife rehabilitator. Um, and that was through my old veterinary hospital. They still currently do um, care for the wildlife at that hospital. Um, I'm not as much involved, although they have tried to send me a chicken or two. And, and I'm like, sure, I'd love to. I'd be happy to do it. Um, there hasn't been that need just yet. I think if there were a raptor center closer to me, that it would probably be the direction I would head. Um, so, so far in the last couple of years, I've really mainly focused on dogs and cats as my big, um, I did do a lemur though, um, actually a couple of months ago, I had a lemur come through, um, which was kind of fun to pull my exotic medicine hat back. Uh, you know, put that back on for once, but I, I do miss it. I miss working with birds. And uh, so I've kind of turned that more into my just appreciation of raptors at this point. And that's one of my side things that I do is I do, you know, go out in nature and just experience the the animals and canoe and kayak. And of course, being in Florida now, it's very easy to do that just in my backyard. So. And Tommy, I remember looking in my acupuncture book, Um, my textbook Mm -hmm. there was a whole section on avian acupuncture and I actually thought to myself who does this who does acupuncture on on birds so it's obviously you yeah it works quite a lot Yes. Wow. I, I used to do it a lot on um I did it on some bearded dragons with some constipation issues um and general ADR kind of feel um we did uh I did a ferret uh, who actually I had just done surgery on the ferret and uh, they had um, they were had ileus and not moving. And, and so I did acupuncture and the ferret would only eat when the needles were in. So the owner actually brought the ferret to me every single day and we put needles in the ferret would eat and would be fine. And that lasted for like a week and then finally decided to start eating on its own. That ferret should have passed away many years before it ever actually did. And uh, and I think that was because of acupuncture uh, for sure. And uh, sometimes you just have to make up points and think that, you know, this is probably where the point is on this animal. Um, It was well before Dr. Shea at the Chi Institute had come up with his 
um, acupuncture right. points for the exotic animal, um, you know, the sheets that he has. And so I was just kind of making it up as I went around and, and it worked. <laughs> so I was pretty thrilled about that. And the birds, I mean, we've used it on uh, lovebirds with little hand needles. Um, and that helps mm -hmm. with seizures. And, you know, it's, it's pretty cool what acupuncture can actually do. So you've also treated some animals in South Africa, haven't you? So I did. you yeah. went to Kenya and then you came to South Africa to um, help in um, baboon conservation. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I missed Africa. And if anybody's never been to Africa, you have to go at least once. Um, it's something in the air. You just, it's an addiction. And after I went, I decided I needed to go back. So during one of the summers of that school, um, I ended up going for the whole summer and I went to a baboon rehabilitation center, which there are usually anywhere between 500 and 600 baboons on site. Um, there, some of them are, uh, they are permanent residents and some of them are getting ready for rehab and are rehabbing and going for release. And um, at that time, Rita, um, who was guiding the center, she needed somebody to help her with medical care. And while we had a vet, the vet was 45 minutes away. So she was like, do you want to undertake this? And I'm like, OK, I will totally try. And um, I ended up actually messaging my dad a lot, um, who's a human surgeon, and was like, what would you do if this was a person? <laughs> um, because I had limited experience with primates at that point. And um, and I used a lot of tools and, and vets on the phone and my dad on the phone and really learned a lot. At one point, we had about 14 baboons in ICU. That was my, they were all in, in um, in cages in the ICU and I was in charge of basically taking care of them, giving their meds and making sure they were going the right way. We would constantly have to, you know, sedate them, IV fluids, things like that. And um, I really started seeing my love for creating bonds with my patients. And um, I knew that like every morning I walked in, the baboons were really depressed. And I would come in and I would start singing a song to every single one of them. And I, they had their own song. And pretty soon, every morning I would come in and they would all be up and smiling and just like dancing in their cages, so happy to see me and hear their songs. And it was like a way for me to be, bring brightness to their day. And that's kind of how I feel like my patients are now in the rehab sector is being able to see that. Um, in their faces. They're excited to see me because they're getting better and they feel good and, and everything's positive. And, and that's something that I think I was missing a little bit in gen med because sometimes you do cause pain, you do cause, you know, fear and you do, and those were things that were really hard for me because animals I feel are very close to me and um, that was really hard. So the baboons taught me that lesson that you can, even if you're like, have some fear yourself of the animals, because as you well know, their canines are, you know, really very long, uh, longer than lions, in fact, and, uh, and they can hurt you pretty bad. Um, and so I made it, I made it an experience of a relationship based training. Um, and that also has affected the way that I handle animals and dogs and cats and I create more of a relationship with them and um, and then I worked on enrichment as well and so trying to you know entertain these guys in their larger cages after they were learning to um, or getting better and healing and uh, and then we had the babies of course so everything was was uh, very fun and we were able to release them after about seven years of rehab typically um, and so that was a great experience for me. And I went a couple of times, so <laughs> uh, I couldn't just stop at one. <laughs> it was great. I, I love that story about the bond that you formed, because I, I really, I, I mean, I, uh, I think it's the same for me, you know, with veterinary. Um, you know, we, you don't really get to spend that much time with the mm -hmm. patient, whereas in rehab, you're really spending a lot of time. You really get to know their personality. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, those ones that just will not give up, they just keep going. Yep. Um, and those ones that come in and they're just looking a bit sad and down and you know that you can try and cheer them up and, mm -hmm. and then the other ones that come in they're just happy all the time and you just mm -hmm. really get to know their personality mm -hmm. um, and I must say yeah. I one of the hardest things about veterinary for me was putting animals to sleep yeah, and I in my mind I actually thought that 
in rehab, I wouldn't have to do that. So, yeah. um, I, and, and it's, I thought that that would be okay for mm -hmm. me. I remember really getting really emotional at the end of the day, you know, driving home, often just bawling my eyes out, you know, yeah. just with all the pent up emotion. And we were taught never to show emotion. So you're not allowed mm. to cry. I never cry in front of a client. And so mm. I always thought that when I got into rehab, that I wouldn't have to do this. And this was mm -hmm. like, you know, one of the things, um, but then I never thought about how I would build such relationships with them. And then the yeah. loss that I would have just when, even when it wasn't me putting them to sleep, just when I, you know, they passed or their vet put them, them to sleep and just being so sad and the relationship that I built with the owner and them and, and that connection. So it really is a lot stronger than veterinary. Not, not that we don't have that in veterinary, we do. Um, but I think more so in rehabilitation because we spend so much time with our patients mm -hmm. and our clients. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. It's it's very challenging, and and I did, I did tell most of my owners. I said, you know, I, while I could still euthanize your pet, I would choose not to. Um, this is not the direction that I want to head, and I am happy to be there and hold your hand through it and cry with you. But I'm I can't do it anymore. Um, it's just, I mean, my soul was hurting so bad. There were days I would do, you know, euthanize mm -hmm. ten animals in one day. And, and just, I was like, I can't, I, I couldn't even kill a cockroach at one point, you know, like I was like, this is my soul hurts. And, uh, it, and what I've been able to do is kind of work through that and cry and grieve and be okay with expressing emotions yeah. and okay with being sad. And, you know, degenerative myelopathy, uh, you know, I've mentioned to you is, is one of my hardest diseases because even when I start off with the owners and we know it's degenerative myelopathy, I start off with, this is a horrible disease. I'm going to be right there with you through every step of the way. I'm going to be your resource for information and we're going to lose our babies here and, and it, it's going to be awful. And what I can do is I can help you to get more, a little more time, a little more quality time and, and be there for you because I've been through it so many times before. And, and I still typically cry in the first initial visit with these guys because I know what I'm going to get into. And then from there, I'm their strong person. I, I get them through it and we, you know, ups and downs with DM as it happens. And, and we're able to grow together. And those are my best clients. I mean, I, I see them with the new puppy that comes in. You know, they're always bringing their new guys to show me. And I love it. And then some of them are like, will you just check them out to begin with, make sure they're okay? And I'm like, of course, I'd be happy to. Even though they don't need anything, people still are constantly, they've developed a relationship. And that is so meaningful, you know, especially in, in such a depressing world sometimes that we live in with people that are not happy with veterinarians or making sour comments to their vets. To have people that really respect the bond that you've created and to show that is, in my opinion, very awesome. And that gives us some light into the veterinary career um, that right now appears to be kind of, you know, doom and gloom, if you will. And And so that's the the uplifting piece. And I remember I listened to uh, the, web, uh, the, uh, the webinar by uh, Carrie Adrian about degenerative myelopathy. And I remember her saying, she's like, this is one of actually my favorite diseases for the reason of creating a relationship with the owner. And I think that's a really, uh, it's an interesting comment. I, I totally believe it. I still don't like the disease and I want to find every way possible to get rid of the disease. Um, but I think it's, it's very, it's a, it's a great comment. I mean, we develop such amazing relationships with our patients and with our owners and, and the, the one case in particular, his name was Momo and he was a German shepherd dog that, uh, was an amazing competitor. He was an agility athlete, he was a dock diver. He pulled carts, which actually made wheelchairs way easier for him than any other dog. Um, and he was just, uh, we used to call him, you know, Thug Momo because he didn't care. He was like, whatever, I got this, I'm in charge, you know. Um, he was fantastic. He And I did acupuncture on him every single day for, or every single week, excuse me, for a, a year. Um, or it might have been a little bit more than a year. And we did underwater treadmill every week. And the owners swam him at home. And they, you know, did his exercises at home. And we gave him a good year and a half of good mobility and the day we lost him was one of the saddest days i mean it was just awful um because he was such an inspiration for so many people and for so many other dogs in my opinion and um 
we ended up taking his wheelchair and passing it on to another patient and donated the money for that to uh, the German Shepherd Dog Rescue um, in his name. And, um, and so he does live on in other dogs and, and he's a great dog and we still have all of his pictures on the wall. And that's something else I forgot to tell you that I do is that all of the walls in my clinic are covered with pictures of patients. So I have it set up as if it's a living room so that my family is on the wall and uh, the, the clients come in and they sit in comfy couches and I sit on the floor with the dogs and they actually literally think we're in a living room. And I work on their on their pets in front of them um, with all of the beautiful stories and pictures and and it, it's a very healing place because of that. And all of those spirits are very happy and they're healing and they're they're in the place and it's it's wonderful. And I still think Momo is still there. Um, and he was a big jokester, so he's always there telling jokes. <laughs> I love it. So, I mean, your practice is not like a traditional veterinary practice, which, you know, is usually very cold and um, very strong smells and just elicits fear, you know, mm -hmm. I think in a lot of our patients. So I actually did quite the same. I tried to also make it quite mm -hmm. relaxed and um, sort of quite homely and um, also had all my all my patients all over the walls mm -hmm. and um, yeah it was amazing because clients would often ask in this one and this one and mm -hmm. ask questions about um, the yeah. ones that have passed away so let's chat a little bit more about the practice now um, and yeah. so you obviously had this five-year plan and you achieved all of that in one year so mm -hmm. congratulations on that. thank I mean, you absolutely amazing <laughs> and I mean it sounds like you're just doing a fabulous job it sounds like your clients trust you so much that they bring their puppies in for you to check and um, and so that relationship building I and mean, that's just so powerful and um, so I'm guessing that you get quite a lot of clients through word of mouth um, because you've yes. got quite a, a good following from your, your current clients I do yes there's a lot of word of mouth um, I can't tell you how many people are like so and so says hi and they sent me here and I mean people are driving an hour and a half to two hours in some cases to come see me once a week um, which I think is a huge amazing compliment um, and and they're sent there because someone else said that you, this is the only place to go you know and and that's amazing it's awesome to me um, and so I use a lot of word of mouth uh, but I also am trying to develop relationships with vets um, because I think it's so important because there's some people and this is when I really started hitting like I got to hit the vets is when people are like I wish I would have known about you a few months ago or a year ago or two years ago or whatever and and that's when I was like okay well how do I get the word out how do I tell these people that I can help their dogs I can help their cat um, and, and so I started relationships with my local vets first because I live in a very densely populated veterinarian uh, region and it's actually a smaller town but we have a bunch of vets and I'm not sure why but we're a dog friendly town it's very fun we actually shut the city down uh, once a year for the annual dog parade and it's a major state road that we shut down for that which is pretty cool um, so I started uh, passing on information First of all, I had to convince them that I wasn't a gen med vet and that I was only going to do rehab and I wasn't stealing their clients. So that was the very first thing I laid out, you know, kind of a line on. And then I started saying, hey, if you have an animal that needs to be treated, please bring them in. There's no cost to you. Um, we will do this at no charge for the veterinarians because they want you to see firsthand what we can do for your babies. And, um, and I said, please let your technicians know. We give them discounts, you know, all that good stuff. And we do all the full work for them. And, and then those vets are the ones that send me more patients than anybody else does because they see it and they're like, yeah, my dog comes once a week and they think it's awesome. And, and that's where, where that relationship can be, you know, started. And then I had another vet that was like, why aren't you doing continuing ed for the group? And she invited me and she invited a bunch of the local county veterinarians. So now I was reaching even further vets from just my local region. So now my whole center of, you know, a pool is, is much bigger and greater. And now I've got people coming from me even further. And then I started doing agility um, talks and started talking to the local groups. Well, then the agility club, you know, an hour away heard about me. So they invited me. So now I have people coming from, you know, all over the place uh, to see me. And then the state veterinary group found out about me and 
invited me to go and do a big presentation for their um, local, the, the conference, their annual conference. And I was like, okay, sure. Except I, I gave them, I said, I have uh, two hours worth of lecture. Here you go. And they're like, can you do six? And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I'm putting right now, I'm putting six hours worth of lecture together, uh, which is fine. It's, it's, it's fun. It's lots of good uh, education for me. Uh, but that's basically how my referrals have worked is that I have reached out, made relationships. And at first it was very difficult, uh, especially to say, I'm not doing gen med. I am not doing shots. I'm not doing blood work. I'm not looking at skin or ears or whatever. And some of my clients were like, why not? Can't you, you're just here. Can't you just say what's in that ear? And I'm like, no, I really can't. And then it was really hard for my old clients who I used to do that for. So that's been a little bit, that was a challenge at the beginning, but I think most people understand now that there is a division and, and there are other people there that can do those services. So the referrals, the vet referrals, it, it meant that I had to draw a line. I also do try and send them back for x-rays. I send them back. I even say, hey, I think you need to get blood work. Hey, I think you need to go and have, you know, X, Y, and Z done. So then the, the veterinarians are actually getting business from me by suggesting that they go and do, you know, diagnostics and things. So I think it's, it's a win-win a situation for most people, and they've realized that. Yeah, I think that's one of the hardest things is that the vets are always worried um, that we're going to take away their clients. Um, so mm -hmm. I think that approach is is excellent. You know, one of the things that a lot of the vet rehabbers really struggle with is just that first reach out to the vet. So mm -hmm. I'm interested to know, was it via email? Did you phone them? Did you pop in? How did you make that very first contact? And was it hard for you? Because I think, yeah. especially if you're not a very confident person, um, to be able to go into a vet new practice and um, chat to a vet and remember some of our vet rehabbers now are not vets themselves so they might yeah. be a vet tech or a vet physio and um it's a little bit daunting sometimes because the vets sure. are not overly friendly <laughs> towards us because they're, they're not big, yeah big yeah. The, the first thing I did was I mailed out um, a letter with information just to kind of put it out there and say hey I am here um, that kind of sort of worked. It probably didn't work so much, um, as well as I thought it would. So then I started, I went around and I went to a bunch of vet hospitals, which took a lot of time. Most of the time, the receptionist would block me from seeing the vets, uh, which I think is a huge problem. Um, because they would just be like, no, we're not interested. We don't refer out or rehab. And I'm like, well, you're doing rehab in-house. And they're like, no. And I'm like, Okay. So it was like a real challenge and the receptionists were the hardest part. And then I started um, making friends with vets friends. So this was like kind of complicated. So then I tried to get into the circle and then the vets started talking. So it was almost like I had to get into the circle. Um, that was how I did it. I think other people, you know, I think giving them a call and actually speaking to them on the phone and say, hey, would you like to come by for a visit? And then I did that with one of our local clinics. I said, they have six veterinarians. And I said, why don't you guys come over for a tour? Um, they did. They asked me all the, the questions. At that point, their biggest questions were, are you prescribing CBD? What are you doing with these? Our clinic doesn't believe in this, that, and the other. And I'm like, that's totally fine. You know, I totally respect what you want me to, you know, do with your patients. But I invited them. I had them in the, the, the clinic. They saw what I could do. They saw the cool stuff. They saw that I did not have lab equipment around, that I didn't have x-ray, that, you know, all of those things were, it was just rehab. So then I started getting people sent from there. Um, and so it was, it was, it took me a long time. It, it, I would say that my relationships are probably now a year and a half later are probably the strongest after a year and a half. And I've worked really hard for that. The final thing that I think that most people could do that would help is the the sheet that I made up that basically puts it in in common terms about what we do. So we treat arthritis, hip dysplasia, down dogs. You know, we put it all in kind of a list form of things that we treat, and then put it in a very colorful, beautiful little stand up thing with our cards in front of it, and then just put it in the veterinary clinics. So then it created a conversation for the owners to have with their vet. Do you think this would be something that we could do? And the vets would be like, oh, yes, we heard about them and, and all that stuff. So that ended up, it, it just was a conversation starter. I don't think you're going to, in this day and age right now where we're at, 
vets do not know when a dog needs to go to rehab. That's just not in the training, you know, nobody, and most people you're dealing with right now don't even know what rehab really is. So it really has to come as a conversation starter. So I actually think out of everything I did, that that little pamphlet was the best thing that I did was, and I put it up in all around the town and um, in restaurants. I put it in the pet stores. Um, I put it in all of the veterinary clinics. And people are walking around with the little flyers and with the, you know, the cards and they're like, we saw you at, you know, the local um, breakfast place, you know, and, and so we thought we would come in. And so that I think was probably the best thing that we did. And what were they like in a little plastic stand? Mm -hmm. So did you just yeah. supply the whole thing to them? You said, can I just put it in your shop or put it yep. in your bed practice? Exactly. Yeah. Just got little, they're little, they're on Amazon. They're just little, like, I don't know, I think they're like five by eights or something. Um, and you just, you can stick a little poster piece of uh, paper in the back and then it has a little section for your cards to sit on. And, um, and, and you just create a nice little poster that has, you know, just what you do. It doesn't have to be very involved, just a couple of things and then put your little cards in front and people were like, Oh, I love this. This is great. We saw you at the vet clinic and, and I can't tell you how many people started a conversation with their vet about that. And most vets were like, Oh yeah, that's a good idea. We are dealing with osteoarthritis and you know, now is the time you need to go and talk to her. Maybe she has some good options for you. Um, you know, and I put weight loss on there, you know, because everybody's trying to get their dogs to lose weight. So why not do that? The other thing I also did was I contacted my local natural magazine and I said, I'd be happy to write articles for you. Um, and you know, just monthly articles and they're like, okay, great. So then they contact me every couple of months and like, can you write an article on obesity? Can you write an article on what is rehab? And I write it generic. I don't write it for my specific practice. Um, and then they, you know, of course, will advertise for me. So um, that's actually been kind of fun. People are like, we saw your article in the Natural Awakening, and we would like to come and make an appointment. So, um, so I basically have just, you know, put myself out there in every single possible way um, to get my name out there. And you know, I don't want to be overly booked so that it takes people months and weeks to get in to see me. Right now, I think I'm probably like a week booked out, and that's about as much as I want. And at that point, I'm going to start making sure that I, you know, put more people in place that they can get seen, at least get in the clinic. <laughs> so you've got a good problem, you know, <laughs> you're yeah. a week booked up. So <laughs> Stop marketing. I don't want more people. But yeah. it sounds like you it sounds like you're ready to grow. Um yeah. so tell us a little bit about um who how many people you have and that work for you. Yeah, so I think we're at six right now, but I have um the person who started with me to begin with, Dr. John, is a chiropractor and is also trained as my rehab assistant. So I sent him to uh Canine Rehab Institute to get the CCRA training. Um, and that was after he'd been working with me for a couple of years at, in treadmill and, you know, I just wanted him to continue his education and it's a really great partnership. Uh, I can send the patients directly to him. These are my, you know, goals. Um, this is the problem that I've diagnosed and he takes it away in either, you know, land exercise or underwater treadmill, uh, which is fantastic. So I've got him helping me out and he's fully booked all week long. I've converted him from human chiropractic work. Um, we, we started off with one day a week and now he's five days a week with me. So um, he's very busy. And then he also will adjust the animals as well. And it's kind of fun because they adjust better whenever you are, they're warm. So he does them while they're in treadmill or pops out of treadmill and comes to adjust them. So that's nice. Um, and then I had to hire um, an assistant to help with sitting with um, acupuncture patients. Um, so I have an assistant that does that. I also have an assistant that does uh, reception, but she's cross-trained to do laser and hold animals as well. Um, and then I have an assistant who actually scribes for me, um, which I know is a big problem that people are always talking about um, on online pet health about you know, how do you do your notes and how do you have time for your notes? Well, I just hired somebody who's really good at typing. 
and she's very smart and she has learned all of the muscles and bones and can spell it all right. So I actually sit there and while I do my exam, I call out my exam notes so that we get it down to a detailed uh, note taking. I can sit there and do goniometry. I can, you know, do uh, muscles uh, circumferences and just holler them out to her. I don't have anybody hold the pets for me because they just lay in front of me usually. And uh, she's really great at that. And she, so I don't have to worry about doing a whole bunch of notes right after I can see a more volume of patients that way because I have somebody else taking my notes. And so that's worked out really well for us. And then I also have a massage therapist who's part-time. She's certified massage therapy. She also does Reiki as well. So sometimes she'll help with Reiki on behavior cases. And then my gift to myself was a hospital administrator. So um, I hired myself a hospital administrator uh, about nine months into it. And that was the best thing ever because I was drowning um, in taxes and business lingo. And do I buy this piece of equipment? Do I not? Do I do this? Do I do that? Do I, you know, how do I resolve like conflicts amongst employees or even a disgruntled, you know, owner that may have had an experience that they didn't want? And finally, I handed it over to her. And it not only was it, it was a great thing for her to do. She came from human health care um, because she was less stressed out. She loves her job. She loves working with dogs. Um, but it's, it was a great thing for me as well. So we're both very happy with that decision. And that affords me more time to listen to my webinars on online pet health and to listen to podcasts and to just be able to be a better practitioner and I'm not so tired and I'm not stressed out mm -hmm. and I can go into the rooms and just, I have everything I need in those rooms and I can forget about everything else going on in the world. I can just walk in there and I know she's taking care of the rest of the clinic while I am in my rooms. And that was a huge thing for me. And I will tell you that all of my friends who are business owners pushed me into that decision faster than I probably would have let myself do it. So anybody that's listening out there that's still managing their own hospital and seeing patients and is underwater, um, please just hire yourself somebody. It's a great present. <laughs> that's so interesting, you know. I, I mean, I think that's one of the things that is so hectic is because, you know, we actually need to be focusing and our energy needs to be right when you're treating patients. And yes. if in the back of our mind we're thinking, oh, my gosh, I forgot to fill in that application for this, for that, your mind's going elsewhere. So to be able to really just switch off, because that's what you need to be doing. Yes. Most of the time we try, but every now and again, you know, when somebody keeps coming in saying, what must I do? This just happened, mm -hmm. you know, and you're mm -hmm. having to deal with all of that, just to give that away, it's fabulous. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it sounds like you, you know, all the problems that you've had, you've just found solutions and you solved them. Yeah. Um, so well done for that. Thank so you. I've never heard of this, getting someone to subscribe, like to subscribe for you. So I'm really interested in that. So does she sit in the consult room with a laptop? Like yep. she's just sitting there, just typing away? Yep. Well, you got it. Yep. I actually, when I set up my um, hospital, uh, because I had, was already kind of doing this um, at through my other hospital for a couple of years, you know, seeing rehab cases and gen med cases. And I had somebody just like, can you just jot down these notes? And then afterwards I would take all of the written notes and we would scribe them into the computer system. And, and I was like, why don't we just do this in the room and skip the step? And so I went out and I found uh, Chromebooks because all I needed to, was to get to my online uh, cloud-based software. And I had created a great exam form on that software so I knew it exactly what I wanted. And I taught her which places to look at and where to type. And she literally sits in the corner. She, she'll get the subjective first and um, come out and tell me kind of the details. I would have already looked at um, you know, the records at that point. Actually, while she's doing that, I have stepped out and have gone and done acupuncture on a patient um, so that that room is now sitting quiet and I can be double booked with rehab and acupuncture at the same time. Um, so the acupuncture is waiting. I'm ready for the next case. She's coming out. She's already made sure that the owners and the dog have water or snacks or whatever they need. 
because we're concierge, we give them what they need. And, um, and then she tells me the details. We go in there, I do my exam. Um, you know, we start at lameness, we go through every bone, uh, bone and joint in the body. Um, if I haven't said anything, she knows it's normal. And, and then at the end, I come up with my treatment plan based on the, the diagnosis, which she's written down with my description to the owner. Uh, she writes down pretty much exactly what I talk about to them. So then it's all written down. And by the time I go and look at it, it's pretty much everything is set. Um, and then my receptionist knows exactly what my game plan was. The clients pop out and they're like, okay, looks like we're going to need to see you once a week for the next six weeks for treadmill and a recheck at the end of that, you know, or something like that. So they already know because it's hooked up via the internet. So they know what we're doing. They're ready for them. My uh, prescriptions are already pulled. Herbals, uh, the labels are already on and the patient's ready to be discharged. So it's a very quick and seamless process. And those Google Chromebooks cost like hardly anything. And they were our Gorilla Glass because the dogs step on them all the time. And because they're always trying to talk to Anna, my scribe. <laughs> and uh, so they step on her laptop and she doesn't care. She steps on the floor with them. And, um, and she's great. I, I mean, if I lost her, I would be probably lost, but um, you know, she's great. And she knows that she, she knows how great she is. So. And so how long are your consult hours? I mean, so like, so how long is your initial consults and then follow-ups? Yeah. So I do an hour and a half initial consult and I started off doing them at an, an hour and started realizing I was pushing myself too late. So hour and a half is the initial consult. Follow-ups are 30 minutes unless I request more time for them. Um, the hour and a half long visit pretty much gets me a good exam, a good description of um, you know possible diagnoses, um, and then we uh, home exercise plan, full treatment plan, and then if there's extra time, sometimes I can get the, the treatment plan going but I'm not rushed in my exam. I can do a very, very, very thorough musculoskeletal and neurologic exam. Um, I also have a stance analyzer as well. So we analyze their stance during that time as well. I'm able to watch their lameness. I'm able to go through concerns. Um, I go through nutrition as well because I do map out nutrition plans, weight loss plans, um, percentage protein. I go through protein requirements. Um, I mean, I try and cover a lot during an hour and a half. Um, I have bone models that I describe what is going on with the pet. Um, and, and then I have their treatment plan ready to go at the end. We've gone over home exercise program and then we seem, send them an email that I actually created, uh, videos of all the home exercises and they click on YouTube links to get to the videos. And uh, we send them an email with all of those and it's got all of, and Anna's basically written them an email out that has described everything we talked about. So they know exactly what they're supposed to do. And then all of that's sent to them. And then I go through once I'm done with all my patients, read through everything and then send a referral letter out of all the notes from the initials and the rehab rechecks as well. So it's a lot, so, but we, I would only be able to do it if I had, you know, my scribe. So. Yeah, so d does she actually summarize the consults, basically everything that was said and then emails it to them? Yes, yes. Yeah. So like you need to great. ice pack, you need to cut back on this food and feed this instead. She's got it all written down because most of the owners are like, do I need to start taking notes right now? And I'm like, no, 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 no. She's taking notes while you hear her typing away. She's taking all those notes for you. And the owners are like, this is amazing. I can just sit here and be relaxed. And if they're relaxed, their pets relax. So nobody's worried. Everybody's cool. Everybody's calm. And um, she's got everything written down for them. Uh, and they get the email. If they have a question, they shoot it back, uh, an email back to me from the same email. And, and then I respond and I can answer their questions. And it, it makes it so that I can focus on my clients. I can focus on my patients. And I don't have to worry about all the other stuff that medicine makes us worry about. Yeah, that's great because, you know, I think sometimes, especially in that initial consult, there's a bit of volume overload for them. Yeah. Um, often they, they, they're coming there with high expectations and maybe what we've told them is not exactly what they want to hear. Mm -hmm. And then they shut off a little bit, but they still want to do whatever we are suggesting, but they forget. Yeah. 
Um, yeah. So I love that idea. And this is a great idea, having a scrap, because we, who has time afterwards? It's one of the biggest things, sitting down, writing yeah. all the notes afterwards. So yes. brilliant, yes. brilliant idea. Thank you. And so um, what days, um, so your times, so you open from 8 till 6 p.m. and what days um, per week are you open? Yeah, it varies. So um, yeah, it varies. So Mon or I'm closed on Sunday, Monday, and then I'm open Tuesday through Saturday. Um, I have late hours on Wednesdays, and then I have um, a pretty long win or a pr pretty long Saturday schedule. Um, I also so Tuesdays I work nine to five thirty. Thursdays nine to five thirty. Wednesdays two to seven. Fridays are ten to four, and then Saturdays are nine to too. Um, so I have these like weird hours and a lot of that came from, um, I mentioned that I overworked myself kind of in gen med. Well, I ended up, um, in the hospital for three weeks with, uh, brain swelling. And after that, uh, realized that I actually could not work that volume. So I had to restrict myself and my hours. Um, and so the amount of hours ended up being about 36 working hours. And that was to limit myself so that I actually had time to do other things um, like business stuff or even to just be able to go run or to be able to hang out with my own dogs or my family. And so I actually, I could be working, you know, seven to seven, no big deal. Like give me six days a week, seven to seven, but that's not, it's not what my body wants. Um, and I had to find that out the hard way. Uh, so I have, been able to set boundaries and uh, and it actually works out. I get to see the the I mean I, I pretty much see a, a very full schedule of patients and like I told you I exceeded my five year plan in a year um, by even keeping my hours restricted but hiring the appropriate staff to do all of those things. So I'm not doing treadmills anymore. I'm not doing land exercise anymore. I am you know, delegating that to people who can do that job just as well. I need to do the diagnosing part. I need to do the rechecks. Um, I need to see that when something goes wrong, I need to, you know, so those are things that I had to really establish. And, um, and that helped me because you can still make money from other people doing your delegations of things. And that's something that I've, you know, mentioned to a few people is, you know, find people that can do your job just as well as you can but that you, you know, don't have to do it. Um, I think the difference between human physical therapy and canine physical therapy is that when a human physical therapist gets a patient, they have an absolute diagnosis. They've had an MRI, they've had CT, they've all those things. They know what they're dealing with. They're treating that one body part because insurance says they can only treat this one body part. Well, in canine PT, we don't always have a good diagnosis. We may have a working diagnosis. They may have come from another vet that, you know, suspected something. So I am there to give them an actual working diagnosis, which may be a physical therapy diagnosis. It may be that they functionally are not moving in the back end very well. And, you know, I can give them a, a hind and weakness or whatever, or suspect, is this from, you know, the spine versus is this from, you know, bilateral stifle arthritis. Um, so that's something that is different. And so even having like a canine PT work, or a, a physical therapist work with me, I've had to tell her, like, you know, things are probably going to have to start with a vet. And then whenever she starts working with me, I will have her be able to do rechecks. But, you know, we have limitations on that. And that's like pretty much the only thing. It's, it's a diagnosis. Um, so other than that, like that's my job and I create the diagnosis. Everybody else can do all the other fun stuff and be part of these really cool fun treatment plans. That was really hard for me, though, at the beginning. Because at first, I wanted to be part of everything. I wanted to do the land exercises. I wanted to do the treadmill. And then I just had to say, I can't do these anymore. So I think I'm in the treadmill like once every four months now, uh, which is kind of nice. It's nice on my body too. Um, it's hard to do what we do. It sounds like you've got an awesome team around you, you know, and I think that a lot of the vet we have as are listening, um, can you resonate with what you're saying? Because a lot of us are like that. We want to do everything. Mm -hmm. And it's so hard to let go. And like you say, you know, there's someone that can do it um, just as well as you and sometimes even better. 
Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, I must say for me in my practice, I also had a great team around me. Um, mm -hmm. And it's really important that we have all the, these different people that come together um, and they all influence the outcome of their patients. And there's so many people that have things to offer. I and mean, so it's yeah. great. I mean, you've got a chiropractor, massage therapist, person mm -hmm. doing Reiki, so many different things. Mm -hmm. um, so in this journey now that you've gone on, I mean, it's, it's very quick. And I think that, um, I, I mean, I'm looking forward to following all the things that you're going to achieve over the next few years. Um, and um, is there anything that if you think back that you would have done differently or are you happy with the path that you've taken? Um, I think I'm happy with where I'm at right now. Um, the, the biggest thing I would have done differently is just change my mindset about it, that I can do this, that I am very capable of building it. And then people were coming. I put a lot of stress and, and at the beginning and anxiety about, is this going to be the right thing for me? You know, can I really leave Gen Med? Are people really going to believe in me? And that was really hard. Like it was, it was just, it was a hard transition to, to do that. And, and I say, you know, put your full faith in yourself and what you are, you know, know that you're meant to do and believe in yourself because if you build it, they will come. This is a, a wonderful, wonderful industry that we have. And it's so new and upcoming and people are going to be more open to it. The, the more we get into it and the more we show them that, just doing physical therapy makes a huge difference in pain management and the way that a dog walks and the way that a cat walks. And, and you can really make a difference in, in people and vets' lives, but you have to believe in yourself. And there, I am where I am because people believed in me and, and, and I listened to what they said. Um, and I think that's cool that, you know, if I were to do it again, I would say that was my biggest, it was the hardest thing for me to believe in myself and say, you can absolutely do this. Um, and at first I've got, you know, help with things and I've, you know, got a vet clinic that is supporting behind me, you know, if I need something, but they're, they're just, you know, at the side right now. If I need them, I can reach out and be like, hey, we need some more clients to come this way, but I haven't had to do that. So, you know, it's it's just great to believe in yourself. And, and that's what I would have done differently. I would have not put so much emphasis on stressing about not people not coming, you know. It's great advice because I think that a lot of us lack confidence, especially when we first qualify. Um, you know, we we just don't know whether, you know, the vets are going to refer to us and that lack mm -hmm. in belief of ourselves. So is there any other advice that you would give those that are just recently graduating now coming into the field? Learn how to communicate with dogs and learn how to communicate with people. Um, because that relationship, like I've kind of emphasized that relationship based um, training, the relationship, the fear free handling that um, owners believe in you and, and care about you at the same rate as they you know, believe that whatever you say is, is, is the truth. And, and so do your work at the beginning so that you're comfortable with these animals that you are, that they're comfortable with you. Don't go into an exam room with extreme stress and anxiety and, and fight with the dog and you're not going to get a good exam. And, and that's the other thing too, like make sure you have an amazing physical um, exam too, like do your, do a great job learning musculoskeletal exams, do a great job learning your neurologic reflexes and what do each thing mean and all the different diseases, like learn your basics and, and then build on that by continuing to learn. Um, and, and that's really, in my opinion, going to make you a very confident and strong practitioner. And that's what people read. If you're not confident, if you're not okay handling dogs, if you're not okay with, you know, maybe different types of breeds of dogs, then people are going to know that and they're not going to trust you. So learn those basic things and then build upon that. And you will build a, a beautiful clientele of people that really trust you and dogs that trust you and love you and want to come and see you. Um, I don't really have many dogs that don't want to come in the door. So, and that's a very common thing that people say a lot. They're like, my dog loves being here. And, you know, Dr. John is their best friend. And I'm like, I love that. Do you think that's wonderful that Dr. John loves to give peanut butter and, you know, has created just a, a beautiful relationship with people. So. 
Yeah, so awesome. And if you compare it to most vet new practices where they just put the brakes on as they come to the door, they're yeah. like, I don't want to go in there. Um, no, I have dogs that actually do it on the other in. way out. They actually, <laughs> oh I, have a, I have a bulldog that puts the brakes on on the way out, but runs in the door. It's hilarious. And the owner thinks it's the funniest thing. She's like, this is, it happens the opposite way at the vet. <laughs> <laughs> That's classic. Yeah. Lisa, thank you so much for sharing your story. I've absolutely loved chatting to you. And thank you for all that you've taught us and all the other vet we have. Is, um, there's really lots that we can learn from you. So thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. Vet Rehabbers, for more information on how to take your career to the next level, go to www.onlinepetalt.com. Please don't forget to subscribe to my podcast so you'll get notified. I'm here every single week talking to vet rehabbers from all over the world, learning, and I would love you to join me. Hope you have an awesome day further. Cheers for now.